like a well-oiled machine up here this morning, right? Gone for a week, and there you go. So, uh, guys, uh, thanks so much. If you're visiting with us today, yeah, it's always like this. Uh, so, uh, no, uh, most of the time I've got my mic. You still got me yet? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. You got me now? You want to just keep talking and you'll find me? Okay. Uh, and I'll yell, so when it comes on, it's going to like bust your eardrums, okay? So, um, if you guys have your Bibles, turn in 1 Corinthians, and um, yeah, but, but before, we're going to be in chapter 15, um, but before we get there, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, that, the, the... All I am, I place into your loving hands. And, you know, I was just sitting there singing that this morning, and um, I just felt like there was this word that came to me, and I just want to share it this morning. That, You know, when we say that, and I, I hope when you guys sing those songs, I, I hope that make them your prayers. You know, make them your prayers to God. And, you know, as I felt like we were singing that, and, and, and it's such a beautiful song, and, and Mallory does a great job, and Steve and the band do it. They do such a wonderful job with it. There, there's people, there's somebody in here today, and you don't think like you can pray that because of where you've been and what you've been up to or your past. <coughs> but that, that prayer is that all, all I am, good, bad, and the ugly, you know? Because, listen, the, the Bible says that Christ died for us while we were still yet sinners. That means Christ died for you on your worst day. Not, not, not your best day when you come to church and everything's fine, right? Right. Amen. And you weren't yelling and screaming at the kids because you're going to be late. Hurry up! And then you get here in the church and you're like, hey, how's it going? Hey. <laughs> And the other thing I wanted to say, too, is that I, I love it when we do new songs that I don't know. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I, I love it personally. You do know when you get to heaven, you're going to have to learn a whole new slew of new songs. You do know that, don't you? And it's just not going to be a continual loop of victory in Jesus, you know. It's just, it's not, you know, it's just, there's going to be new stuff, you know. That's why, you know, that's why God really came. David, the psalms, he says, you have put a new song in my heart. I mean, that's prophecy to when we get to heaven and we worship God the rest of our, the rest of our eternal life. You will learn new stuff. Yeah. I don't know if you'll have to stand the whole time. You may let you sit and sign, but, you know, it's going to be, but it's going to be, you know, I, I love it when we do new songs, and I applaud Steve for doing it because it, it stretches me in my worship, but it gives me a chance to just stop and listen and worship. And, and I think that's sometimes God wants us to just slow down and, 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 and just worship and not have to fumble through the words or bring it up. Can you guys hear me okay? I just get the feeling you can't. can't no, you can't? It must be because what we got is going to be good. Yeah. 
Hello. In the words of my daddy, we're cooking with gas now, boy. All right. I'm, <laughs> y'all didn't hear that. Steve said, don't be spitting in my mic, man. <laughs> Get that everywhere. Okay, so um, if you've got your Bibles, then we're going to be in. Yes, and it is always like this for, your, for visitors. It is always like Okay. First Corinthians. Um, this is... Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, God laid this on my heart, and um, I really thought that it was for last week, and I, I know now that it was for this week, um, and everything that uh, we've been through the last 10 days, uh, for you guys that don't know, first of all, and let me say this, I, I really do appreciate you guys um, letting me uh, be gone uh, for the last couple of days uh, through the weekends, last weekend and this weekend. I lost one of my childhood friends. He died at the age of 49. And uh, you guys, a lot, a lot of you know my story, but he was one of my old running mates, and we did a lot of running around and partying together. And just, um, he, you know, for some of those guys, even though I've left that lifestyle and left all that, but some of my friends, you know, uh, they've, they've left some of it. Some of them have. But, you know, sometimes when you live that kind of life, there's just damage that gets done. And um, unfortunately, we were talking, and, and I think out of the 12 of us that used to hang out, we've, I, we've buried about six or seven of them now. Uh, and I've done two or three other funerals. So um, I, I love him dearly, and um, there are just some things that w- was coming. God's been working on me in the last couple of weeks. But, but thank you guys for, for letting me go and attend and be with that family. That family was like a second family to me. They still are. A uh, huge family, and I, I love them dearly, and loved my friend dearly, and just a lot of things have kind of come from that. A lot of reflecting over these last ten days. You know, when Solomon says it is better for you to go to a house of mourning than a wedding feast, and the idea there is that um, when we go to a house of mourning, uh, we start to look at death, and that makes us hopefully look at life, and it, and it makes us see things that we normally wouldn't have seen, and it makes us reflect that the fact that we're all going to end up sooner or later. So how are we living our life today? You know, and I, I, I kind of want to talk about some of that today. So if you've got your Bibles in, in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, we're going to start off in, in, in verse 1 and go through 11, okay? Um, Moreover, brothers, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are being, you are, you are saved. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, but let's get through this passage. Well, no, let me go ahead and talk about it. Um, well, no, I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Okay, okay, so you are being saved. Uh, you hold fast the word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain, meaning that there will be some that hear it, that believe it, and by, by the idea is that you, anybody can believe in God, right? The Bible tells us that even demons believe in God, Right? But the idea is that um, do, do you believe when you hear the word of God, has the word of God impacted your life to whether it has changed your trajectory in life? Okay, so, so that's what, because there's a lot of people, listen, that, that believe in God. And they believe in the idea of God. They believe in heaven. They believe in hell. Those things are fine. But, but what Paul is saying here is that, that there is a part where, and this is where I think sometimes the, the Bible does a wonderful job, that there's a difference between a believer, okay, and and a disciple. You know, we're all called to be disciples, but what happens is I think some of us believe it, and that and that's and that's fine. But but a disciple or is a follower of Christ. There there will there will be many that come through churches. There will be many that hear the word of God, and and they're they're believers in it, but it hasn't changed their trajectory it hasn't impacted their life they haven't and 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 that's that's how you put your faith in it that that's how you know the 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 fruit of it you see what i'm saying the 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 fruit of it is are you showing fruits of the spirit is what paul says in galatians 5 22 through 24 that's how we know we have faith that's how we know we have faith and paul says and and Paul, paul alludes to that right there when he says you're a believer in 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 vain. I hope you do not believe in vain, which sounds almost like a, 
it sounds almost contradictory, but that's what Paul's talking about. And he says this, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which also I received. You can't give something to somebody you don't have. And Paul says, you know, I received that, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he arose again on the third day according to the scriptures. By the way, that's the good news. If you want it in one sentence, underline that. That is the gospel. Jesus came, lived a sinless, spotless life. He died for your sins and for my sins. He, he, he paid the ultimate penalty for our sins, for, for the, the wages of sin is death. He paid that price. And then God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, rose him, right? Overcame death, hell, and the grave. The resurrection, amen. That's what Easter's all about. That's what we celebrated a couple of weeks ago. And because of that, and if we have faith in that, if we have faith that Jesus is who he says he is, that he did what he did, then the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that you too shall be saved. That's it. That's it. Do you, do you believe that? And has that impacted and changed your life? That's what Paul's alluding to here. And he says, and that he was seen by Cephas or, or by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain in the present, but some have fallen asleep. That's just a nice way of saying they passed away, they, they, they died. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. I think that's awesome. I mean, he wrote, you know, so much of the New Testament, but yet his view of himself is he is the least among them all. Who am I not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God? But by the grace of God, which we all walk in, I am what I am. See, y'all thought Papa came up with that. Paul copyrighted that like 2,000 before, years before Papa ever got, even got on this thing. Y'all go find a lot of stuff. Cartoons, Disney, they, a lot of them stole stuff from the Bible. I mean, the first talking donkey wasn't Shrek. <laughs> you just got to read about Balaam, right? I mean, he had cornered that a long time ago. I mean, God was way ahead of them. They come out with Shrek. Y'all thought that was something awesome. God's like, no, I did that too. I did that like four or 5,000 years ago. Where have y'all been? Right, so I am what I am, he says. Where am I? I lost my place? Y'all made me lose my place. And his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach. And so you have believed, or you believe. Uh, join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, speak to our hearts. When we talk about salvation, we talk about Christianity, where's our place in it? And um, it, it's a wonderful story that's been told. And um, Father, I pray in the name of Christ that you would open up our hearts to that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So if you look at that word, um, if you look at the word saved in the second verse right there, right there that, that's a Greek word called sozo. And it's uh, S-O-Z-O. And it's um it, it really it's it's a word that's in the present tense, meaning um you can say it saved like that. But when I don't know about you, but when I read saved like that, I think of it kind of like in the past tense. When you see that ed on the end of it, you automatically think past tense. But it, in 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 written in the Greek, the more I hate to say the better translation because that's really not it. And some some of the verses of the Bible, depending on what you read, you may have it in there. But it actually is in the present tense, meaning that you would read it to say you are being saved. Okay? See, that kind of, and, and that word saved, it can mean that. It can mean that, meaning like you're, you know, you are being saved from the present dangers and stuff of, of the world nowadays. And that's what the gospel, and that's what a belief in Jesus Christ will do. But the the more... <sighs> The more accurate, I guess, translation would be that you are being saved. You see, that takes on a totally different tone to me. And, and I'll tell you why, of a couple of reasons. It, first of all, it kind of means that you are being saved from, from what's going on uh, around you and currently too. But, but it, it means something to me when, it, when I talk about this too. It, it means the fact that sal 
So, so many times, and I think this is incorrect thought in the church, and I know that I've done it, and I don't know, I don't know if you've ever fallen, um, I don't know if you've ever fallen into this kind of this theological trap. But the idea is that you can get caught up into thinking that, well, salvation is the end game. Meaning that, you know, God just really wants me saved, and then when I'm saved, I just pop the recliner back put her on cruise control and just wait to die and get to heaven right and pray like I pray you know like like I said the other week you just pray dear Lord you know, take me in my sleep that'd be awesome to go like that right and I think that sometimes we we feel like salvation is the end game and sometimes we even in the church we've kind of fallen into that trap too that thinking that salvation well the idea is to just get people saved and then once they're saved then they're they're good. But this last couple of weeks and in, 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 in the death of my friend and, and, and seeing people get saved and, 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 and seeing people being baptized and life's changes and tra trajectory changes, salvation isn't the end game. Salvation is the beginning of the game. Because what's happened is God, has, God is awakening you. And it's not the end of the story. It's really the beginning of the story. And, and, and so many times I think that, that, that we've missed it in, in, in what we've done and, and in how we do it sometimes. That, that God's beginning this, this beautiful story in your life where, and, and God will use all of our lives, but, but we're not really aware of it until we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and he quickens our spirit and he awakens us to it. And then, then, then the story starts to play out. And that's when the story starts to take place. Because here's something I've noticed in Christianity. It's really happened the last, uh, the last 30, maybe 40 years. But it's really been accelerated the last 15. And, and, it's, and it's like this. The, the first point is this. Christianity and salvation, it, it, it's a story that God wants to use in your life, that God wants to tell in your life. It's not a formula. And what do I mean by that? Give, give me a minute to kind of unpack this and don't fall asleep. Stay with me just for a minute, okay? With, 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 the, with the surge of technology, and it all started with the Industrial Revolution, but with the surge of technology, um, we've, we've kind of gotten to the point to where we want things uh, kind of like, you know, in a, in a three easy step program or in a... You know, uh, and you see this a lot nowadays. I think it all started off with the four spiritual laws. Anybody ever heard of the four spiritual laws? A couple of theologians major. Started off with the four, and I think we like that because it's kind of science-y. And, and, and I know some people say, well, mm, science is bad. Well, I mean, yeah, you may think it is, but out of science has come all the technology, and the technology makes your life real easy. Right, and we like kind of easy. That's why you see all these... When you go into a Christian bookstore, you see this thing of seven easy steps to a wonderful life. Five fundamental teachings to spiritual growth. Ten tenacious biblical leadership steps. Eight easy steps to biblical wealth. Right? Come on, am I the only one who sees them in the stores or have y'all seen it? And you know why? I think, I think we like it because we look at this. Don't look at the outside, that's duct tape. We, we look at this big book and we think, you know what, man? If you could just boil it down to me and give me the eight steps to how to figure it out, I, that would be so cool and so easy. And I'll just read that and then it, 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 it will all be good. And I think we like, listen, we like formulas because it makes it easy, it makes it concise, it makes it to where things are simplified. But when you, when you think about the Bible, and when you think about it, it it's, I'm, I'm, I gotta watch how I word this because I'm probably going, it's not a self-help book. See, that takes, that takes us all aback. We go, what? It's not a, a how-to book. 
It's, it, it does, it's not a book on financial principles. Now, it does have financial principles in it. You understand what I'm saying? Let me explain, because I can see deer in the headlights look all across, and I'm going to get emails all tomorrow morning, I can tell. But, so let me explain. Me, the Bible will help you, okay? I, I, didn't say, I didn't say it wouldn't, all right? So don't say, well, you said the Bible wouldn't help you. The Bible will help you, okay? The, the Bible will help you. The Bible has financial principles in it, okay? Shake your head like you understand. Okay, yeah, yeah. The Bible, the Bible has, the Bible has uh, spiritual goals in it, right? It has, it has spiritual helps in it. It has all this thing. But it's just not that. It's not that. It's just not about finances. It's just not about spiritual goals. It's just not about a self-help book. Now, it has those things in it, but it's not exclusively those things. I saw a book the other day in the Christian bookstore. It's a biblical diet book and I thought what and I mean listen it's not if you got one praise God do it it probably help you you know it's got to be better than some of the stuff we're eating nowadays anyway so you're probably gonna be good but it's like this and, and I've told people this before the Bible has history in it but it's not a history book the Bible has music in it whole book of Psalms, but it's not a hymnal, right? It, it, it has, and here's what, here, when, when we try to make it those things, we're missing it. We're missing it. And listen, I know it's true because I've even done it with it for years. And I think sometimes my preaching, and preaching all across Christianity nowadays from from North Carolina all the way to California and everywhere in between and all around we, we do it and I, I think sometimes we give you an intro and three points and a conclusion and everybody goes well man, if I just do those three things I'm gonna be good well yes and no but I, I think you can't listen there's a reason new diet books come out every year Right? I mean, there is. Because they work for some people, but they don't work for everybody. And there's a reason they keep coming out with them every, because we keep buying them every year. Because we keep thinking, well, this is going to be it. This is going to be the silver bullet. This is going to be it right here. This is going to be. And, and you, we can't treat the Bible like that. Now, does the Bible contain those things? Absolutely. But it's not, it's not, it's not the ultimate self help book. Listen, the, the Bible is, from start to finish, it tells this epic story about God and about mankind. And, and, and through it, it weaves this beautiful story, listen, of God's redemption and mankind's struggle. And, and the thing that's so beautiful about it as it opens up is it's this beautiful story that's told. And the thing that's wonderful about it is it's all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other little stories. Stories about a man by the name of Abraham who was chosen and walked out with God by faith and had a son named Isaac. And Isaac had a son named Jacob. And Jacob had a lot of sons and those sons. And it's about this nation's movement through time and through history and it tells this wonderful, epic story. And here's what I want you to see. Christianity is not a formula. It's a story about what God wants to do in your life and what God wants to do in my life. So salvation is not the end of the story. Salvation is the beginning of the story because it wakens us up to what God is doing in our lives. And, and here's the beautiful thing. God is the author of this story, and, 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 and it's so neat to think, and we don't think of it like this, and I didn't think about it until just a couple of days ago, but it's so neat to think that God wants to include your story in with all the other stories you've read about in the Bible. And when we get to heaven, it's going to be this beautiful story of redemption told by millions and millions and millions of people's lives lives and it's all going to come together to make this beautiful symphony of redemption 
Now, I said all that so I could say this and preach. So in the next 20 minutes, here we go. Here's, here's the first thing I want to share with you about stories, okay? Here's, here's the first thing. Every great story has a protagonist and an antagonist. Now, I don't know about you, but before kids, I used to read a lot. And I read the classics, you know, Superman, Batman, <laughs> Spider-Man. And I've learned this about, uh, about great literature, And that's this. Every great story has an antagonist and a protagonist. Now, what do you mean by that? Uh, literary majors, you know what I'm talking about. But for those of us who are simpletons like me, you have a hero and a villain, right? And every story has one. Every story is defined throughout them. Every story is, is made uh, with those. And for you and I, the struggle in our story will be who will you be defined by? Who will you be defined by? Because when it comes to antagonists or when it comes to the, to, to the protagonists, we have to ask ourselves this. Uh, and when bad things happen to us and when disaster happens to us and when tragedy befalls us like it did this past week and that we wrestled through, you, you have to ask us that. Who, whoever, who do you choose to be defined by? And, and, and when I was talking to people this past week and, and, and talking to other people throughout life, and, when, and it really brought up ideas when Caleb died too, I was thinking about this too, that, that, it, that if, if you end up being the victim because of a tragedy, then you're letting yourself be defined by the antagonist and not the protagonist. You're letting yourself be defined by the villain. If, 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 we, if we start making excuses for our behavior, if we start making excuses, if we start passing the playing the blame game and saying, well, you know, you don't know what they did to me or you don't know what happened to me or you don't know what's been going on in my life. And listen, I understand, uh, I think I understand pretty good that bad things can happen to people. I understand the fact that tragedy befalls people. It happens throughout every story in the Bible and it happens to so many people. And I know that you could be in here and it happens to it's happened to a lot of people in here. Some, in some ways, you felt like maybe you've been dealt a bad hand. You didn't have the mom or that you should have had. You didn't have the dad you should have had. You didn't have the parents. You didn't have the upbringing. You, didn't, you, got, you got dealt a bad hand. And I understand what that feels like. But, when we can, but, but we can't let ourselves be defined by circumstances and we can't allow ourselves to be defined by the antagonist in life. We have to allow ourselves to be defined by the protagonist, by the hero. And the hero in our story is Jesus. And when we choose to walk with God, when we choose to walk with Jesus, when we allow to operate in forgiveness, when we allow the story to be told through God's eyes, with God's hands upon us, then we're allowing ourselves to be defined by the hero. And you know, I, I thought about this uh, on, on, on Friday when we were doing the funeral. Victory doesn't come for us at, at the end when we get to heaven. Victory is defined by, for us throughout the midst of the journey. When we face tragedies, when we face death, when we face failures, when we face shortcomings, when we face bad hands and raw deals, when we face those things and our faith is placed in Christ Jesus and Jesus helps us to rise above that. That's when the victory, rise above the tragedy, rise above the antagonist, rise, rise above the circumstance. When those things happen in our life, then we're choosing to let ourselves be defined by the hero. And victory comes to us. You know, and I thought about the life of Jesus. Think about this for a minute. The last week of Jesus' life really sums up life in general. The, the, the holy week is a week where every, everything seems to be going right. Jesus comes into Jerusalem, the palms are flying, heroes welcome. And then tragedy falls on Friday. Blacks, uh, well, you know, good, it's called Good Friday for us. Where it seems like everything that can go wrong does go wrong. 
You ever had that happen to you in life? Where you wonder why you even got out of bed? And it seems like that everything that happens is bad. And sometimes it lasts a day, sometimes it lasts a week, sometimes I've been through months like that, but in years where it just seems like one bad thing just dominoes right behind another. You know, life is like that sometimes. And then there's, the, then there's Holy Saturday, but it's this day where Jesus has died and he's in the grave and it seems like God is silent. You ever had these periods in your life where it seems like God's silent and your prayers aren't getting answered and every time you pray, it's just bouncing off the roof and coming right back and you don't you feel like God's not there, that God's left you, that something's gone wrong, that you've removed yourself from God's breath, that God can't find you in life. And, but then I'm reminded of Sunday. And I walked in here today, and it was, it's been a long 10 days, man. It's been brutal. It's been a lot of traveling back and forth. It's do, doing a childhood friend's funeral, dealing with family, and just friends, and, and, and it's wonderful. But when I came back in here on this morning, I thought, victory! Sunday's about victory. It reminds me of resurrection. It reminds me that Jesus has overcome. It reminds me that the hero wins. He wins! And, and he wants to write that into each of our stories. The hero with victory is ours. After Friday and after Saturday, Resurrection Sunday speaks to God's victory in our life. How God yearns for that in our life. How God wants us to walk into that in our lives. Ugh. But it's up to you. Who are you going to be defined by? Because God loves us enough to give us the choice. He loves us enough to give us the choice. But it's your choice, not mine. And each one has a choice to make in his or her story. Who are you choosing today? Are you choosing the villain or are you choosing the hero? And the next thing is this. Will your story read like a bedtime story or an action novel? Uh, this past week, dealing with Maddie, Matt McClellan was my friend. And, and um, it just, it brought, back some, uh, it brought back some awesome memories, really funny memories too. I'm, you know, real funny. But I thought about two things. And I thought the same thing when uh, Caleb had died too. That uh, there, there are two, kind of, two types of regrets in our life. And uh, the first one is uh, when we regret things that we've done. Now, now don't look at your spouse you know, when I say that. It's a great way to catch one in the kisser right here in church. Or an elbow to the ribs. You know, it's those, it's, those, um, it's those things that we've done in our life that you think about even now. It can be 20, 30, 40 years later, and you go, <laughs> it gives you like the heebie-jeebies that cringe, makes you cringe. And um, it's those things that you, you wish you hadn't have done. It's those things that you wish you hadn't have said. You wish you hadn't have done. You wish you hadn't have been there. You wish you would have listened to your mom and dad, even though you would never tell them that. Right? And it's those things that you wish you hadn't have uh, of done. I call those uh, regrets of commission, meaning that they're things that we commissioned into our lives. And th then the, the second time regret is the regret of omission. Regrets of, uh, of omission are like um, things that you wish you would have done, but you omitted out of your life. You know, things you, uh, you, you look back on and you go, I wish I would have done that. I, I wish I would have taken that chance. I wish I would have you know, walked out in this a little bit more. I wish I would have followed that dream. Uh, they're, they're what I call regrets of, a, of omission. And, and here, here's the thing that I think about when, when I think about those things sometimes. And this is how I, it applies to our walk and it applies to, to, to God and how God writes our story. And I've seen it especially in the church ever since I've been a part of the church and, and, and grew up spiritually in, in the church these last 20 years. Um, we understand 
the sins of commission. As a matter of fact, uh, we've even adopted into our theology. There's a lot of ways that the church believes that you can obtain holiness by subtraction. Meaning this, um, we understand that when, when people come into Christianity, the first thing that God wants to do is that God wants to start subtracting things out of our lives sometimes. You know, that's the big, don't do this, don't do that, thou shalt not do this. And, and we understand that, don't we? I mean, we get it. I mean, listen, the older I get and the wiser I get, and I can say that because my wife's not in here. So, uh, you know, the idea is that w we understand the fact that, that there will be things as we walk with God and as how God writes our story that God will want to subtract from our lives, that God will want us to lay aside, that God will want us to put down. You can't do some of the things at 40 that you did when you were 20, right? And as you grow and as you walk and as God starts to write your story, there's this, uh, th there's this how God wants to do this subtracting. And, and I get that. But I wonder if in some ways we've, we've, we've missed a big part of it. I wonder if God is just as concerned too about regrets or even sins of omission. that how God wants us to step out in faith, how God wants us to take a chance, how God wants us to do this, or God wants us to do that. And, and I think sometimes, sometimes we may miss it because we like the comfort level and we like where we're at and we like how life's going. And so we sometimes miss and I wonder if the sins of commission or the sins of omission, I wonder in God's eyes if they're just the same, but we've made it more about the sin, you know, doing, growing by sins of commission, by subtracting than, than growing by omission. Here's the thing. Let me see if I can get this worded right in my head. Badness isn't just the absence of goodness. And goodness isn't just the absence of badness. Let me allow it to explain. I can do nothing and still be wrong. Right? You see, I think sometimes we, we, we think that the idea of Christianity is to run away from sin. And it is, don't get me wrong, okay, it is. So, all right, don't, don't say, well, hang on now, he's preaching something different. But what if, it, what if it's not just to run away from sin, but what if it's to run towards what's right and good? What if it's not just to run away from sin, but to run towards God through faith? What, what if it's not just to run away from sin? What if it's to run with God and step out and take leaps and bounds? What if it's not about just life being comfortable? What if it's about God shaking things up? What, what if it's about us stepping out of our comfort zone? Because think about this for a minute. The, the, the stories in the Bible, there, there's two main reasons why we love them so much. And I don't even know if we realize it. I didn't even realize it until I started thinking about this even more. One of it is we, we love the stories about these men and these women in the Bible because they're being led by faith. Now, we know what's around the corner, but they don't. And, and, and what if we've settled in and settled for less and we, we've, we've made Christianity and its holiness and, and about our spirit? What if we've got spiritual maturity wrong? What if it's not just about subtraction? What if it's about multiplication because God wants to add multiplication in our lives, but we have to step out and walk with him in faith. And the stories that we love in the Bible so much, they appeal to us, is because there's these men and women being led by faith. And God stretching them. And, and, and we see this beautiful story, this tapestry. But the common thread that runs through every single story, the ones that appeal to us, that make our hearts skip a beat, that make us leap with joy and anticipation, is the same thread that runs through every story. And it's this faith that leads them in God. And what if that's what God wants for us? 
He doesn't want our story to read like a bedtime novel. He wants it to read like an action adventure. Where it's bam, 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 and things are happening, and we're being led by faith, and we don't know what's happening, but God knows what's happening, and we're trusting in him. And that leads me to the last point, and I'll close with this. You get to choose the main character of your story. This week... The thing that I saw and the thing that I loved and the thing that it came to mind when I was reading different stories in the Bible and I was reading my friend's journal is, uh, is the fact that we get to choose the, character, the main character of our story. Now, everybody thinks they're the main character of their story, but what if you're just a minor character in somebody else's story? I think it's supposed to be funny. It didn't go across like that, okay? <laughs> See, Steve, I told you it wasn't funny. God will allow you to choose the main character of your story. He won't force himself to be the main character. But I'll tell you something. The stories that we love the most in the Bible, the story that resonates with you, the stories that you've read and that have literally changed your life and your outlook and your perspective and how you've approached life and that have helped you in desperate times, and that speak to you about biblical principles, and that may even speak to you about biblical wealth, and that may even help you on your biblical diet plan, are the stories where the main character in them is God. Where Jesus is the main character. And where men like Paul and Peter, I love the story of Peter. I mean, I know he was probably a loud mouth like me, so I guess that's why we kind of get along, you know. I think he was ADD like me, you know, and he said stuff and didn't think about it. My wife says I do that all the time, and I know it's probably true. And so I think, I think when I get to heaven, man, I'm going to gravitate toward Peter. You know, Paul's more of the scholar. I think he'll be talking over my head and stuff. But Peter, I think we're going to really get along, and, and I, we're going to have a great time just talking. And I think part of the reason is I, I love the story of Peter. And... and and how Peter, you know, he, he, he comes up to Jesus and he says, you know, all these other clowns, I'm paraphrasing, all these other guys, they may, they may forsake you. I got you back, JC. I have got your back. I am with you, man. We're, we're going to be solid. We're tight. I will never leave you. Or say, I'm going to tell you what, you know, I'm not. And then, and then Jesus says, Satan wants to sift you as wheat. And I'm sure Peter kind of muttered under his breath, bring him on. I don't care. And then we know how, what happens to Peter. A slave girl comes up to him and says, weren't you one of those Galilean guys that were hanging out with, with, that, with, with Jesus of Nazareth? And Peter, being questioned by a little slave girl, says, no, wasn't me. And then the Bible says that he even ends up cursing the name of Jesus. No, I do not know that man. And it looks like, if you know the story, it looks like that's the end for Peter. And the Bible says that when Jesus finds him, he finds him fishing. Now, he wasn't just out wetting the line over here at the Waccamaw River just enjoying, enjoying an afternoon of, of Saturday relaxation and fishing. He had gone back to his previous occupation. Meaning that, it, 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 he, you know, that was Peter's life. So he had walked away. This defeat in Peter's life had been so huge, had been so catastrophic, had been so life-changing that it devastated him to the fact that he had gone back to what he used to do. And we know the story. Christ finds him in this broken, heartfelt, broken, guilt-ridden, shameful condition. And restores him. way that Peter had denied Jesus three times Jesus restores him will you feed my sheep yes I will 
will you feed him? Yes, I will. It was as Jesus was saying, every one of your failures, I got them covered. They're covered. If you'll just let me be the author of your story, if you'll let me be the main character, I will write a story for you through faith that will be seen and read and heard by many. And that's what God yearns to do in our lives, to weave our stories into theirs. So it, it, it's not just a mic of stories, but it becomes this epic story of redemption and love and forgiveness. And you'll look back on it and you won't have the sins of omission. You won't have the sins of regret about, I wish I would have done that. Because you will, will have walked with God through faith. And I don't know where you're at today. I don't know where God has you with it today. But the whole idea there is Paul says that we're being saved. So let me ask you the question, and let's put a handle on this today as you leave here today, because I want, I want this question to stir in your heart, stir in your soul, and I hope it leads you into change of perhaps where God wants to lead you by faith. But the question is this, how are you being saved today? Not how were you saved 20 years ago, not where you were saved 20 years ago, but what is God up to your life, in you, doing in your life today? Where does he have you where he's got you stepping out by faith? How are you being saved today? How is your story being written today? Join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Christ. Paul says that, that we are being saved. As we put our faith in, in the Word and we put our faith in Christ. That God yearns to write this story because salvation and, and, and our walk with Him, it's not a formula, it's a story. And how God wants to write this beautiful story that weaves a thread of faith and love and mercy and forgiveness through it. And how God yearns to have that story told and will use it. And so, Father, I pray when we talk about salvation, it's not just something that happened to us one day. Salvation is the beginning of a beautiful story that God wants to write. And as we are being saved, as we are walking by faith, I pray that you would open up our hearts, Lord, to what you have for us. You would continue to speak to our hearts, Lord, in the name of Christ, trusting in you, having faith in you. In the name of Jesus, we pray.